my energy back to me with divine care. Whoever, whatever is living off my light energy, run that back, get your own. I'm emotionally gifted, so I must guard that gift with wisdom and firmness. My openness is emotionally generous. I must be watchful. I'm seeing who are and aren't skilled to receive. I receive what others blind spots. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Dan Roth, and with me, I have Dr. Eliana Ramirez. We are so pleased to have you here today. This is an incredibly important conversation. It's an incredibly meaningful conversation, and it's a potentially triggering conversation. Dr. Ramirez has graciously provided a link to the Black Women Toxic Job Suicide Prevention Resource Guide in the chat. If at any point during this conversation you need space, you need a moment, please make sure that you take that. Please make sure that you are conscious of your feelings and emotions and validate them in the moment as we will as well. We do have a couple of momentary breaks to provide people the opportunity to sit with things for a few moments. So we really want to be conscientious of the emotions and feelings of everyone watching today. Now, before we get into it, I want to state that this is being recorded. If you do decide that you can only stay for a certain amount of time or you want to watch a replay or you want more information, we will provide those links after the event uh, so that you have them at your disposal uh, for those purposes. Now, again, I, as I mentioned, I have Dr. Eliana Ramirez here. Uh, Dr. Ramirez is not only an expert in the field, but she happens to be a very close friend of mine. And I think we've known each other for about three years. The work that Dr. Ramirez has done done the work that she does is so incredibly needed and not just now but it's been needed all along and it's going to be needed in the future and when we talk about people that are implicit components of change that's dr ramirez now because I know Dr. Ramirez as well as I do, I am not going to sit here and talk for her. I am going to talk to her. Uh, Dr. Ramirez, I know you have a ton of people tuning in from your audience, but for those uh, in my audience, can you please introduce yourself and a, a bit about what you do and really why we're here today? Thank you so much, Dan. And thank you to everyone who's tuning in now and who might watch this later. Um, I am tuning in from the unceded lands of the Thamian Nation in Silicon Valley, California. And I want to always start by acknowledging that the Thamian Nation is still here today and they are making major um, uh, trainings for available for our local fire department to prevent wildfires. So. Unlike the stereotypes about indigenous invisibility, the Thamia Nation is still here and they're keeping us all alive in the Silicon Valley. So I just want to give that um, heartfelt gratitude to them. So I'm a social worker by profession. I am a researcher. I study racial and LGBTQ related workplace trauma. I have worked as both a clinician. I'm also currently working as a coach. I founded Hostile Workplace Recovery LLC which is a company that helps Black, Indigenous, and other people of color and LGBTQIA2S people defend ourselves in the workplace and recover our health, both our physical health and our mental health from workplace abuse. I got into this field um, many years ago. Actually, my dissertation was focused on trauma and recovery among LGBT service members and veterans who served under anti-LGBT policies like Don't Ask, Don't Tell and the Transgender Military Service Ban. And so from that work, 
gosh, that was like 14 years ago, um, I really started to get interested in what happens to us at work. How do, do the stressors from hostile workplaces, from workplace bullying, intercept with the larger stressors that we're all experiencing, global warming, war, COVID-19 and other infections, wildfires. So many of us are kind of crispy around the edges. <laughs> Forget about the workplace abuse. We're already crispy because so much is happening. Systemic racism, murdering of black people by police. And then we come to the workplace. And if we face hostility there, it can really very quickly overwhelm our health. So that's just kind of a short intro about the kind of work that I do and why. I really appreciate you addressing that. And, you know, one of the things we talk about with your logo is the significance of, of the hummingbird, which I know is a direct correlation to your heritage. Uh, and before we get into that, I just want to state that this space is a very inclusive space. If you see me looking around in different directions, please know that's not me uh, being ignorant. It's answering everybody's questions, making checking everything. Uh, so just want to make you aware of that because I know it could sometimes look, uh, but when you're producing, there's tons of things to do and we want to make sure we get everything right. So speaking of, if you have a question, if you have a comment, I'm go I am going to be checking. If you have a question that wants to be addressed, feel free to message me directly. I will put all the questions to the side and either at the end of this discussion, or afterwards, one of us or both of us will get back to you. Uh, we will not leave anything unanswered. I also want to acknowledge Dr. Uh, Rupi Leha, who you will hear much more about towards the end of this, as we are going to be doing a series uh, that is going to, I mean, I'm just excited to be able to produce it. Uh, you two are, are just such incredibly dynamic individuals. and. It's a blessing uh, really to be able to work with you. So I don't wanna miss the, the fact that I did ask you a question. Can you explain the significance of that hummingbird? Yes. Um, ah, okay, so there is an amazing Mexicana artist who's down in Los Angeles, Gabriela um, Malinausochi Zapata, and she, painted this image that was like un un unlike anything I had ever seen before. And so when I reached out to her um, to ask her to create this logo for me, um, I asked for an image of a hummingbird that was feeding off of the flower of a saguaro cactus. Um, the hummingbird is and that's that's the that's the image that she ended up creating. So you can see she designed it um, like the Aztecan codices. Um, the eye is representative of the universe and the stars and the sky. And there is in this belly of the hummingbird an infinity symbol that is talking about life um, before all of the generations, prior generations, current generation, future generations. And the hummingbird was very, very important to the Aztecan people. The hummingbird is, is beautiful and it's fast, but it is a fierce defender, fierce defender of itself and its community. And that's what I wanted to get into with Hostile Workplace Recovery LLC is I wanted to help BIPOC and LGBTQ people learn how to defend ourselves in the workplace when we inevitably face uh, overwhelming and inappropriate stressor, stressors, discrimination, hostility, and abuse. So many of us are the first in our families to go through college, to get into these offices that have, frankly, white supremacist um, practices and cultures that are extremely dangerous for those of us who are historically underrepresented. And so I wanted to bring in this image um, that's part of my own ancestry. I identify as Chicana. I am a light-complected, um, Mexican, Irish, Czech uh, woman, and I am second generation in the United States on the Mexican side of my family and uh, second generation on the Irish, Czech side of my family as well. So that ancestry is important because what I've found is that when we can connect to our cultural ancestry, we find a source of resistance and resilience that is 
especially important when we're experiencing discrimination in the workplace because the stereotypes, the stigmas that are told about us, that are lying on us and undermining our credibility, our ancestors develop res responses to that and we can really learn a lot from that. One of the things I notice is such a high level of intentionality that you have from the design of your logo through the message that you're sending. And I know that's not by accident. Everything that you do has a meaning and a purpose behind it uh, because every action is meaningful. And, and I just want to acknowledge that. So as we get, let, let's, let's start with the basics because while we think we may know, the reality is that definitions uh, tend to somewhat get muddled together. So can you go over what workplace trauma and recovery is? Absolutely. Thank you for that. Um, and I want to also thank you that you started us off thinking about accessibility. So for folks who might be tuning in who are living with blindness, I am a light-complected um, femme. I have bright red lipstick, earrings, long brown hair, and a braid. I'm wearing a black onyx necklace that's in the shape of a heart from a Mexican silversmith, and I'm wearing a black blouse with red roses on it. So the term trauma is a term that we hear a lot these days um, in social media, in the media, and um, the difference between stress and trauma. Stress happens throughout our lives. We can have short-term stressors like uh, when we run into traffic on the freeway, or we can have major stressors like ongoing difficulty keeping the lights on in our home because we don't have a job and there's no source of income. Trauma is when we are unable to defend ourselves. You might have heard of fight, flight, and freeze. These are nervous system reactions to an overwhelming stressor. So when we are unable to defend ourselves, to effectively fight, get away from the stressor, effectively flee, we oftentimes will freeze. And that can look like our mind going blank in the middle of a really intense work meeting when somebody is coming at us in the wrong way and we can feel their aggression at us. Um, we can freeze and lose our train of thought. Or it can be really severe where we end up experiencing suicidal ideation, which is really common in the workplace. And I want to acknowledge again that underneath this event in LinkedIn, I put a link to the Black Women Toxic Job Suicide Survivor Resource Guide. That can be useful to anyone who's on this call. You don't have to be a Black woman to find useful information in there. I've got crisis lines that do not involve law enforcement. There are also places to find mental health providers. And there's a lot of information about workplace abuse and recovery. So workplace abuse that leads to trauma is not just like a difficult colleague who's kind of grumpy. It's really about chronic overwhelming stress. And we see things like being demeaned, devalued, discredited, undermined, humiliated in the workplace. We see harassment, ridicule, belittlement, um, being alienated or falsely accused having our privacy violated. This is a really common thing that can happen in abusive workplaces that will lead to trauma where a colleague or a supervisor or even HR will spread information about us that's private, about our health, about our mental health, about our family life stressors. Um, and the reason why people do this kind of thing is to undermine our credibility and to sabotage our ability to do our job in the workplace. Um, we also see that people are ignored or avoided, intentionally left off of business meeting invites, intentionally um, not provided the resources that are needed to do their job. That, so that's kind of what I mean by sabotage. We see people being excessively written up or disciplinary actions without collecting information from everyone who has information about the situation. Um, we see people um, weaponizing performance evaluations to um, undermine a person's ability to continue in their job. So therefore, they're prevented from getting a promotion or they might actually be demoted. Um, we see people 
um, giving deleterious job references. So after the person is forced out of the company, either to save their own sanity or help, or they are terminated, um, then the company will end up giving negative performance of that or negative referrals, job references to continue the abuse even after the person has left the job. So all of those kinds of behaviors over time can lead to trauma where the person's physical health start to be degraded and their mental health. And in fact, I just want to share this because I think a lot of people will think like, oh, these, you know, people today, they're so sensitive at work. We've always dealt with this kind of stuff. This is not about being politically correct. In 2021, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, EEOC, made illegal, and I quote, offensive jokes, slurs, epithets, intimidation, name calling, ridicule, mockery, insult, put downs, questioning an individual's identity, end quote. So we know now that the kinds of behaviors I just described are directly associated with health problems like heart disease, diabetes, cancer, uh, metabolic illnesses. And the connecting piece between these kind of workplace stressors that can become trauma to our health is that when we are in a work environment that involves that kind of hostility, our body responds by releasing stress hormones. And those stress hormones will flood the body and lead to inflammation. And the inflammation is what is associated with those metabolic illnesses and that then can become those chronic health problems that we see overrepresented among communities of color, among LGBTQ folks, among people who are living with neurodivergence, for example. Such powerful information. And I, you, you said something really important in the beginning and I, and I want to make sure that I'm also inclusive. Uh, bear with me because I'm colorblind but I am a white showing Middle Eastern male with a green background, green shirt, I think, uh, glasses, a bit overweight, a little bit chubby, but that's father weight. Um, I also want to recognize the people in the audience. There are a number of people that are making really impactful, powerful statements. And I want to acknowledge that I I'm purposely not liking your comments. And the reason that I'm not is because there's a fine line between um, liking something for the sake of it and acknowledging the power in what you're saying. And I don't wanna cross that line. So please know that we're internalizing everything that you are saying um, and, and paying respect to it. Uh, and once again, this will be in replay. Dr. Ramirez, in speaking about workplace trauma and recovery, I do want to link something that's happened over the course of the last five years so that we could create uh, a, a picture. The world of diversity, equity, and inclusion has lost a great number of people in the field, but that field was also was focused on creating change for those in marginalized communities and black communities and uh, Latino communities and LGBTQ uh, two two S. Do I have that right? Yes, two spirit. Thank you. Two spirit. You're welcome. So, my question is: Is there a difference in the work that's being done from a DEI perspective versus workplace trauma and recovery? Are there similarities? Where is the intersectionality there? Yeah, I think there's absolute intersectionality, and I. I want to just quote Dr. Resma Menikim, who wrote My Grandmother's Hands, who refers to DEI as DIE. And the reason why he says that is because in most companies who hire someone to do DEI work, diversity, equity, and inclusion, so they're hiring, especially if they're a person of color or a queer person or a person living with disabilities and they're out about their disabilities, the story is that they're hiring us to come in and create an equitable workplace where everyone has an opportunity to succeed in the workplace and to be promoted up the chain of command. And we do that theoretically by creating policies and practices that create an environment that everyone can flourish in. Unfortunately, what we see is DEI backlash. We see active 
um, undermining of DEI specialists who are actually trying to change the recruitment, the retention, and the promotion of underrepresented people. So we find many communities will hire us because they want us to do a Taco Tuesday, for example. They want us to bring out the sombreros for an hour, have some tacos, and everyone feel like now we've dealt with diversity at the company. But they do not want us to actually look at what are the percentages of people of color or queer folks who, or neurodiverse folks who make it up to the highest port portion of the company? To what extent are there policies in place so that our transgender or gender diverse employees can use the restroom safely at work, right? When we start to actually challenge the status quo and um, the factors that keep underrepresented people from pursuing higher um, job access, that's when we end up being forced out of companies. And we see this over and over and over again. And so in 2020, we saw $3.4 billion being put into DEI initiatives across the nation. And then at the same time, we're seeing a huge backlash where people who are in those DEI positions are being fired or forced out of companies at higher rates than other job positions that are um, promoted on like LinkedIn and Glassdoor and so forth. And so what's happening here, where there's an intersectionality between this DEI backlash, and frankly, Dr. Um, Yvonne Taylor talks about it as, as um, white lash, frankly, because this is what has happened historically throughout this country, where whenever one group of people who have been historically marginalized end up with a little bit of power, then we have a backlash that comes in, right? And so this is consistent. We know this stuff, this has always happened, but where it intercepts with the workplace abuse side is that oftentimes the ways that the company forces the person out that they hired in that DEI role are through things like institutional betrayal. And what that means is when the power of the organization is weaponized against the person. So the DEI hire comes in and they don't do just the Taco Tuesdays, they do some real meaningful work to um, encourage people of color to make it into higher ranks in the company. And suddenly we start to see that people throughout the company um, start to spread rumors or gossip about that person. They start to cut that person's budget. They give them an overwhelming workload that is inconsistent with other people at the same level of directorship across the organization. So they're sabotaging that person's work. The person eventually goes to HR and says, hey, I'm being harassed. Somebody is using these terms or they're undermining me in this way. And then HR, instead of protecting the employee, which is the agreement that we all make when we sign on to work for a company that they're going to create a healthful work environment that's not going to hurt us. As soon as we bring that um, complaint to HR, then HR, instead of defending us as they should, they defend the company by turning the power against us. It's called DARVO, defend, attack, and reverse victim and offender. And this is Dr. Jennifer Fray's work out of Oregon. So the company will say, oh, you know, they'll start pulling up racist tropes. Oh, she's an angry black woman, or she's an over-emotional Latina, or, um, you know, she's an inappropriate queer woman in the workplace because she's talking about sex all the time or something like that. So they're using these existing stereotypes um, that are racist or homophobic or transphobic against us and then force us out of the organization. So rather than saying, oh, this black woman is repeatedly being met with hostility and undermined, and of course anybody would feel frustrated with that, they go the extreme and say she's an angry black woman and force her out. So I think that the connecting piece between the DEI and the workplace abuse, especially for BIPOC and LGBTQ people, is that Racism is a common line throughout. The systemic racism is the reason why we need the DEI in the first place. But as Dr. Resma Menachem said, it's actually more accurate to call it DIE because what ends up happening to people of color and LGBTQ people who are in those DEI roles, who end up, our lives are destroyed. Our lives are absolutely destroyed when we are forced out and undermined by workplace abuse. Um, you know, Normally, I segue to things. You actually nailed the head on what I was going for, which is the idea that companies are actively weaponizing. 
and create, how do I put this? So companies are subjecting, are knowingly subjecting potential employees and employees to trauma by knowingly creating barriers, by knowingly reinforcing glass ceilings to the point where you set, I mean, even the statistics at one point were 70% of DEI executives were white, but the bulk majority, I think it was over 80% were those from marginalized communities. So we're seeing such high churn rates because they were hitting that glass ceiling with promises that were never fulfilled. Now that does lead directly into what you do with hostile workplace recovery and the differences between what you do and what's been done before because one of the things i love about you is you look at everything and you immediately find those gaps that are not being looked at that are not being covered and you from a compassionate place look to fill those gaps and i'm aware of it i've been aware of it but i really want the audience to learn how hostile workplace recovery first of all was created and implemented but then how i think the big question is always well how is this different than everything else that i've seen thank you so much dan and i receive that compliment um with so much gratitude. Thank you. Um, okay, so I've been looking at workplace abuse for many years, as I mentioned for my dissertation. Um, I also have been addressing um, overwhelming workplace stress as it affects the behavioral health workforce. I um, designed a program um, that was specifically to help psychologists, social workers, peer specialists, psychiatric nurses, um, at a very difficult time in our society come together when our clients were experiencing simultaneous existential crises out in the world to help our behavioral health workforce um, kind of let up, acknowledge that we were both living through these simultaneous crises as people. And when we came to work, we were being overwhelmed by companies that were like, oh, you're a person of color. Why don't you fix racism right now? Because George Floyd was recently murdered. And at the same time, we had clients of color coming in, refusing to work with white clinicians and demanding to work with black indigenous and other people of color clinicians makes complete sense because they don't need to theoretically explain to us their experiences of racism in the world. But what happened is that for our BIPOC and LGBTQ behavioral health workforce, we were being crushed by the simultaneous overwhelming stressors out in the world. And then what was happening in the companies, because the companies had not hired enough people of color, frankly, to be able to care for the magnitude of people of color in the community. And so um, when I was doing that, um, it was a really powerful opportunity for BIPOC clinicians and peer specialists to join forces to realize that what we were experiencing, the anxiety, the depression, even the post-traumatic stress disorder from that overwhelming stress was normal. There was nothing wrong with us. We were not broken. This is what happens when you put too many, put too much stress on a person and, and it's unrelenting. So I looked at that, those issues there. And then at a certain point, when I was trying to figure out um, some severe workplace abuse that I've had which has happened in a couple of different places because I've always been the one to kind of be like, let's talk about the LGBTQ folks. What is needed right now? What's happening for our BIPOC employees or patients that um, oftentimes has brought the ire of imposter leaders on me who then um, got issues. So trying to figure out what was happening to my life and to the life of so many other people that I care about and respect who were being forced out of companies I got into the research because that's my coping strategy. And I started to learn about workplace abuse. I started to work about the, learn about the differences between workplace bullying and mobbing, for example. And I realized that so many of us who are the first in our families, first generation to go to higher education, to make it into these offices, that we had not been trained by anybody, by our families, because they didn't know what to tell us, how to protect ourselves and what to look out for. 
Um, and we weren't being trained by our professors to know how to handle the institutional betrayal that we were inevitably going to face if we were actually uh, pursuing justice, like the National Association of Social Workers Code of Ethics uh, compels us to do. I know psychologists also are compelled to address issues of injustice. So what happened was I decided to create a hostile workforce recovery, a workplace recovery as a place where BIPOC and LGBTQ people can learn learn about the dynamics of what we're experiencing in the workplace, learn how to strategically defend ourselves in the workplace, and importantly, learn how to help to heal the damage to our bodies and our minds from that workplace abuse. So I bring in the neuroscience of trauma, and I think this is very different than what a number of other um, individuals who are doing coaching around workplace abuse. Um, I'm everything for me is evidence-based. It's about bringing in the science and the research to understand what is actually happening to us. The other side that's different for workplace, um, hostile workplace recovery is that I also bring in somatics. The ways that using our nervous system and toning our nervous system can help to interrupt the stress hormone flooding and the injury um, from chronic workplace abuse. And then finally, the third piece that I do that's also different is I bring in a cultural lens. I'm especially focused on BIPOC and LGBTQ people and people who are living with neurodiversity and other um, ident identified experiences that are considered to be disabilities. But we know from uh, the Dif disabilities rights movement that it's really our society that disables people. Right, it's our society and our workplaces that are set up without the um, resources necessary for everyone to access and do their jobs. So it's really our society that's creating this rather than individual people. And what I do in Hostile Workplace Recovery LLC is for example, group coaching. And group coaching is not group therapy, it is different. I am bringing together groups of people who are workplace abuse survivors for us to identify our individual goals for recovery, because it's gonna be different for everyone, what our injuries are from workplace abuse and what our goals are to for recovery. I infuse these sessions with information from the literature, the research that is available at this point, and I'm doing research on my own. So for example, I'm doing um, a study right now about people who are pregnant or caring for infants in hostile workplace experiences, whose babies end up being injured by that workplace abuse. And we know from research that what happens to a grandmother, for example, the stress in her life when she is pregnant with a daughter, that daughter in her belly at that time already has the building blocks for her own eggs. Okay, so the grandmother in a workplace abuse situation being flooded by stress hormones, those stress hormones are not only causing injury to her body, but to her baby's development and can impact that baby's future babies. So three generations of a family can be permanently deleteriously affected by workplace abuse. And I've not seen people talking about this. So I'm currently doing interviews with people um, who have had this experience. And Dan, it has been horrifying to hear what has happened to these babies. So this workplace abuse group coaching cohort that I'm doing, I'm bringing in the research that's existing. I'm bringing in research that I'm currently doing. And I'm creating a space where workplace abuse survivors can speak in safety among one another. Because so many of us are literally, huh, we're being stalked on LinkedIn, Dan. We're being stalked on other social media. I cannot tell you the number of people who private message me and say, I loved that post you just put up that was about self-defense in the workplace, but I can't like it publicly because I'm being stalked my, by my current or former abusive employer. So I created this space so that we can talk to one another because what we find, and this was the key to my own workplace recovery, Dan, People who are targeted by workplace abuse tend to be bright, compassionate, ethical people who just wanna do their job. Thank you very much. 
We just want to go to work, do our job, and be left alone and go home. We tend to work for imposter leaders, people who were promoted without necessary subject matter expertise, people who find us an existential threat to them. We're just shining, doing our job at work, but they find our the way that we show up at work and our success at work to be a threat to their identity. They fear exposure as an imposter, and that's why they target us. Because we tend to be ethical and self-reflective people after we've been bullied and especially after we've been mobbed, even though we can say on one hand, I knew that they were being horrible to me and they were cruel, we oftentimes will wonder, is there some way that I could have prevented that? Why didn't I see the warning signs of how dangerous they were at the time? Why didn't I you know, build a better self-defense or something like that? So we start to victim blame ourselves. And what I found is that connecting with other workplace abuse survivors, especially on LinkedIn, helped me to realize that this is actually exactly the group of people that I would want to be around. Look, if you're a DEI leader and you haven't been fired or run out of a job, I don't know that you're actually doing your job. <laughs> I don't know that you're actually like challenging the status quo enough. So that's what I found is like bringing these workplace abuse survivors together. We can hear each other's stories and be like, oh, they did that to you over there in that department, over in that profession, in that company. The same thing happened to me. And we start to realize, Dan, there's nothing wrong with us. This is systemic abuse. And in fact, the fact that we were targeted might mean that there's something special about us. Extremely, extremely powerful. I want you to know that you have people in the chat saying they need you in Nashville, that you know, this is the right timing for the conversation. There's so much love that's going on for you. Now, I'm gonna ask you, a I know we have a lot to get to, but I'm gonna ask you a challenging question, and I hope that's okay, okay. because it's a very real reality when it comes to the work that you do. When it comes to workplace trauma, when it comes to healing, how do you support members of the same marginalized community that have gone through trauma because they were weaponized against each other? Yeah, I'm so glad that you brought that up because it's not uncommon. And you might've heard my voice drop an octave down because I feel this on the deepest level when Latinas attack other Latinas in the workplace, when Black women attack other Black women in the workplace, queer people attack other queer people in the workplace, we think that these people will be our natural allies, right? In Black communities, there's the, the, the phrase about all skin folk aren't kin folk. And what that means is that that particular kind of betrayal trauma, whew, <laughs> when these people who really should be our allies, because they know, they know exactly what the heck we're going through. They had to fight through the same battles to get through higher education into that workplace that we did. And then they turn around and what they're doing is they are choosing their proximity to whiteness, to heterosexuality, to gender, to masculinity over their own community. It is a sadness and a sickness that is Ooh, <laughs> I got some choice words that I won't share publicly right now. It's not professional, but honestly, like when I can calm myself, I know that these are people who are extremely injured by racism, sexism, homophobia, and they have such low self-worth and value that they think, and they're foolish enough. Ooh, let me just say that. They are foolish enough that they think that those white men up on top actually care about them and will let them stay. Mm -mm when these people who are from diverse marginalized communities attack others within our own community they're doing it because they think that that will get them higher up in the eyes of the status quo and they think they'll be safe there but they're never safe there at any point in time that company will turn their back on those people as well so i just want to acknowledge the unique kind of injury that happens when our own community does this and there's a history of this right we can look at migrant farm working and we can see how Mexicanos and Filipinos as well who are working in the fields would be hired as the foreman to abuse the workers in the field. We saw this dur during shadow slavery. We saw it even during colonization as well. This is nothing new. And oftentimes the kind of violence, psychological and physical violence that happens from people of those marginalized communities who are put into that kind of a role is even more intense, it's more insidious, and it's more dangerous than when a white person is doing that to us. 
And oftentimes part of that is because we're taking down our guard a little bit in the first place. Yeah, I wonder if like we just share, I shared a lot, I could feel my own energy. Should we do a little break for a moment yeah. and we can watch? Let's, let's, let's do that, let's go to the break. Let me, and let me say for people, we're gonna do this. If you rock side to side, if you're feeling activated right now, this is an activity that can help to bring your nervous system down. So I'll play it one more time just to give everybody another moment. Mm, good breath, Dan. Good breath. So, you know, th this is triggering for, I know, even though we're talking about this, I know it's triggering for both of us because we're in the field, we do the work, and this is not stuff you could avoid every day. I mean, everything from the onboarding and tra trainings that people go through to the way the system is constructed with the barriers of entry, every single segment of society has been created intentionally to create trauma. It's not an accident in the United States. And I want to be very careful that I say in the United States, because different countries um, have different things. Now, we have a lot of resources. I'd like to go through those resources because, you know, whenever we do these lives and something that I notice with you and something that I certainly try to, to emulate is that when we have these discussions, it's not just about the discussions, it's about solutions because anybody could have a conversation but what do you do about it? What can you do about it? Where do you go? And that's such a key component to you and I. So I'm gonna bring up a couple things. Let's start by going back over uh, the resource guide for those that may be tuning in. Okay, thank you. So I was, um, I created this resource guide following the passing of Dr. Antoinette Candia Bailey she died by bully side. She worked at Lincoln University, a historically black college university, where she was being severely abused by her boss, who was the president of the university, um, a white man, actually, who was married to a black woman. Um, hmm. And he was so hor horrific towards her that she ended up having um, mental health challenges that came up. So many of us can relate to this, depression and anxiety. She asked for family medical leave to get a little bit of space. He refused her request. She then went up to the board, the governing board of the university, and they refused. Remember the mobbing part, right? And the weaponization of the, of the institution. They refused. They said they don't involve themselves in personnel matters. So that gave the green light to her boss then to fire her. And within a matter of days, she had died. This is not uncommon, Dan. This happens too much. And knowing that our current crisis care system is broken, especially for Black women, especially for all Black people, all Indigenous people, for Latinos, for so LGBTQ folks, for so many of us, calling 988 or calling 911 in a mental health emergency oftentimes brings law enforcement. And when law enforcement show up with weapons, people die, especially black people. And so I wanted to create a, a resource guide that provided access to crisis care that did not involve law enforcement and that attended to the actual stressors that are related to suicidal crises among people who are workplace abuse survivors. Look, I've been doing suicide prevention for over 20 years now. And what I know is that our current suicide prevention efforts are not based in the neuroscience of trauma. They are expecting brains to work like non-traumatized brains do. And so this Black Women Toxic Job Suicide Prevention Resource Guide describes a little bit of what happens when we have a suicidal crisis. We are not broken. We are not crazy. It is an automatic thing that happens at a nervous system level, at the vagus nerve that connects the brain to all of the organs in the body. We are not weak. 
we are not um, uh, sick. We are, we're doing what happens when our nervous system gets activated like that. And I see that you've brought up this um, flyer for an upcoming event that I'm doing with Physi Physicians Anonymous. So physicians have one of the highest rates of suicide among all occupations in the nation. Three to 400 physicians die by year, die per year by suicide. And the amazing group Physicians Anonymous with whom I'm gonna start um, facilitating one of their anonymous support groups for physicians. I'm so honored that they asked, asked me to do this. Um, what they do is they provide opportunities for physicians to receive support if they're experiencing suicidal crisis, if they're experiencing substance abuse, if they're experiencing burnout, depression, anxiety, to access these resources in a way that will not threaten their careers. So physicians every couple of years have to um, have their licenses to practice renewed. And in many states across the United, United States, there are questions in that application renewal process for their license that if they were to answer honestly about accessing mental health care or having a suicidal ideation, it could destroy their opportunity to work. It, it could prevent them from getting a new license. And there are so many factors in the workplace that are driving so many physicians to this point of abject pain that they're trying to get away from. There's no other recourse. And so that's what this, this event is about. We invite everyone to attend it. You don't have to be a physician to attend this event. In fact, we really need people who are not physicians. Maybe you have a parent or a child or a sibling who is a physician, or maybe you care very much about the doctors and you're so grateful for the doctors who have helped you throughout your life. Um, every We need everyone to start to show up on behalf of supporting physician um, suicide prevention. And we're gonna talk about ways to do that through Physicians Anonymous. I appreciate uh, you going through that. It, it's such powerful. I'm going to bring up, if it's okay with you, then we have one, we have a couple more. Actually, is this the same? No, this isn't the same. Nope. It's okay. different. I, yeah. I, it's the same amount of pages. So I was like, oh, wait a second. Yeah. Um, yeah. So stay tuned, everybody, because we have a couple more things after this. Uh, but what is interrupt? You know, I'm a speaker and I can't pronounce that. So I. Misogynoir. Mis misogynoir. Misogynoir. Thank you. So misogynoir is a term that was created um, by Dr. Bailey. Um, she it is a term that refers to the intersection of racism and sexism, especially as it um, uh, becomes apparent in social media and in images. And um, so with um, Vice President Kamala Harris's run for president, we saw and are continuing to see an uptick in racist and sexist images against black women in particular in the media. And so I did a study on LinkedIn where I asked black women on LinkedIn how they would prefer for people who are aspiring to be allies um, when they see these misogynist, uh, misogynoir things happening on LinkedIn, how they would prefer us to um, interrupt that misogynoir. Because unfortunately, when we try to stand in alliance with other people, sometimes our good intentions actually do more harm. Okay, so I'm specifically thinking about in 2020, some of the things that we saw like on TikTok and other places, white women in bikinis putting pictures of themselves on social media with a, a tag underneath it that said, ha, made you look, hashtag BLM. That, wasn't, that was not um, an authentic help. That was, um, they weren't really trying to get people to support Black Lives Matter. They're trying to get people to look at them in a bikini. So because we have this history in this country where sometimes um, good intentions can go sideways, uh, the white person in a meeting sees a black woman being referred to as an angry black woman in the meeting and she might be, the white woman becomes so upset that she starts crying in the meeting. Well, that takes attention away from the racism and sexism that's happening to that black woman. It's bringing all the attention on that white woman at that moment. So whether it's intentional or unintentional, sometimes when we try to help another person, we actually cause more harm. Um, and so 
this this study that I did on LinkedIn, and I'm so grateful to the 20 plus black women who responded to it, what we found is that 0% wanted us to do nothing. Whether you are at work and somebody makes a racist, <clears throat> excuse me, sexist comment, or you're on LinkedIn or other social media platforms and you see someone doing something wrong, you need to say something or do something, right? That's the first thing that we know. 65% of the women who responded to this survey said that they wanted us to say something in that moment, like, hey, this message or this image is not okay. And um, a smaller proportion wanted us to report it up to LinkedIn to remo remove that post uh, that was problematic. So this, um, in addition to putting the data from that study into this um, guide, I organized a panel of black women and other women of color and a white identified um, queer person, uh, trans person to talk about what we can do if we are not black women to interrupt misogyny when we see it happen. And I just want to do a huge shout out to Jaya Malik who um, worked on, on um, this, this uh, guide with me and was also on the panel. Just absolutely incredible the work that you're doing now. Uh, we have a video of yours, but before we get to that, I've been mentioning in the chat that this is not the last of this conversation. And that is for a very, very specific reason. Now, I want to state that there are times to be in front of the camera and there's times where other people are best in front of the camera and you get to do, I get to do what I do best, which is producing. I am honored, privileged to be able to produce this series for you and Dr. Rupi Leha, uh, Crisis Care at the Crossroads, Coercive Control to Community Care. It's going to be starting on October 30th uh, with part one. We're going to be doing a part two and we're still working out what we want to do for part three. So from here to part four, we're gonna, it's going to be a four part series. So. I really would love to hear from you how this came about, uh, what the focus is going to be and what people can expect to take out of it. Thank you, Dan. Uh, I did, let me just say that, like, I don't know, I might be the biggest Dr. Rupi fan on the planet. I cannot okay. tell you, she is by far the most amazing psychiatrist that I've ever met in my life. And look, I looked, I worked in a hospital for a long time, so I've met a lot of psychiatrists in my life. Dr. Rupi is amazing. She is the anti-racist MD. She has this incredible training program that's a, to create systemic change against anti-racism in our healthcare systems. She is a community-based psychiatrist who is explicitly anti-racist. And if you're not following her yet on social media, please do. She is phenomenal. Just today, she put out this amazing video about about um, oppositional defiance disorder, ODD, and its relationship with racism and how we um, treat children of color who are being injured by the racist society in which we live. And she even ties it all the way back to the history of racism in the country with Drake Dominion. So um, Dr. Rupi um, and I are doing this series talking about the crisis care um, crisis, frankly, that we're in, where you call 988 and you know what? They've got a fourfold increase in bringing police law enforcement to you, even though you're not trying to get involved with the police over the previous lifeline crisis line. Um, so for many of us who were trained as social workers, psychiatrists, uh, psychologists, psychiatric nurses, when somebody says they're experiencing suicidal crisis, our minds automatically go to 911 or 988 and send the person to the emergency room. Well, both of those actions can actually cause more harm to, and in fact, it can be lethal harm, right? To people who are experiencing mental health crisis. Best case scenario, we survive that interaction with law enforcement, but then we end up in an emergency room where that is not helping us to come down from our suicidal crisis. Emergency rooms are terrible places where there's too much uh, activity and um, and pressures. And oftentimes people who are in suicidal crisis, they could sit in an emergency room for 12 hours or more before they even are sent to an inpatient psychiatric hospital where typically there's zero suicide prevention. You sit there and you watch TV. 
and then you're discharged. So instead, Dr. Ruby has created this brilliant community-based approach to help people survive suicidal crises and other mental health crises in community by partnering with family members, by partnering with other natural support systems, friends, partners, and others. Um, and so, and I've been working on the crisis care at a neurosystemic level. So helping people to activate their nervous systems as a form of immediate suicide risk reduction because we need to be able to get the thinking part of our brain back online, which is offline when the amygdala, the um, alarm system part of the brain is running the show. And that's what happens when we end up in suicidal crisis. So I'm so excited uh, for this. And I'm delighted to be able to work with Dr. Rupi on this and you as well, Dan. Oh, I gotta tell you, like when you told me about Dr. Rupi and I started doing my research, I started getting giddy. When people see the work of Dr. Rupi, oh, pardon my French, but holy shit. Yeah. Like it's, it's mind blowing. And um, let me just put it this way. Once you hear Dr. Rupi speak, it's going to change your life. And, and, and I, I'm too direct to, to make that up. Um, I do want to provide everybody a, a bit of a call to action, though. So first of all, the events are going to go up today. So part one and part two, I'm going to be putting those events up today. I just haven't had a chance to do uh, to do it yet. If this conversation interests you, there are ways that you can act. One is connect with Dr. Ramirez uh, and, and Dr. Rupi. The second is check out their websites. The third is share that information, whether you are somebody that needs the support or whether you know somebody that needs the support. The last thing that we need is silence. So make sure that you're providing that information because you never know when somebody is going to really need that and is too afraid to reach out. So you sharing can be the difference mm -hmm. between them thriving uh, and barely surviving. Uh, and I mean that wholeheartedly. Uh, the second thing is when I put those out, make sure you click attend so that you're notified. Everything I do is fully recorded. I'll be cutting up clips. Uh, I don't know how because you've dropped so much incredible information, uh, but I'm going to try uh, and go from there. Now, before we finish up, and I don't, I don't even remember if we talked about how much time we we're going to go for, but... Dr. Ramirez and I both have children, so we have to be mindful of that. Um, I am going to take this opportunity to play a short video from Dr. Ramirez, and then we'll come back with anything we may have missed. Uh, and if there are any questions, again, feel free to reach out to myself. Feel free to reach out to Dr. Ramirez. Uh, feel free to reach out to Dr. Rupi. And I can assure you that by the time the 30th comes for part one of the series, we will have a full on resource guide, everything in one spot. So it's really easy. That's some, that's one of the things I am working on. Uh, and if you want LinkedIn to pick up and do more of these events, let them know. Uh, this These sorts of conversations have not historically gone over too well but we need to change that dynamic the only way that you're going to do that that we're going to do that is by making it known so with that go ahead before we jump into this i just want to say and i don't know that i've shared this as explicitly i am a workplace abuse survivor i ended up with post-traumatic stress disorder because of my workplace abuse and i know because of my own recovery that recovery is possible no matter how, if you're a workplace abuse survivor, no matter how your thought processes have been changed, um, you might have difficulty concentrating, you might have difficulty reading and taking in new information, you might have difficulty remembering stuff. That is all healable through neuroplasticity. Our brains can always heal and recover. And our bodies can even heal and recover so much of the damage from, from um, chronic stress in the workplace. And so this video is sharing some of the things that helped me in my recovery. Um, I really do encourage you to get in touch with me, please. Hope There's so much reason to hope. 
no matter how much pain you're in right now, there is reason to hope. And I'm here for you. And there's a whole community of workplace abuse survivors who are making it, who want to bring you into our folds. Thanks, Dan. You're welcome. And with that, uh, this. <laughs> Eliana, I, I want you to know that throughout this conversation, and I know that your focus is on others, you have given such a gift to so many. This is a needed conversation. You have created a needed environment for people to heal. And I feel like it wouldn't be, I wouldn't mm -hmm. be doing my duty if I didn't say on behalf of everyone watching and on behalf of myself, thank you for being you. With that said, before we close for the day, is there anything that we've missed? Anything mm -hmm. we need to go over? Uh, I will not shut this down until we get through everything you want to get to. So. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, uh, I think I just want to put out there that 49% of workers in the United States are impacted by workplace bullying. Either they're targeted by workplace bullying or they witness some else, someone else being bullied at work. And just witnessing another person being bullied at work is associated with depression and anxiety. So we don't talk about this because there's stigma about workplace abuse. You know, in the United States, we have laws that outlaw child abuse. Uh, domestic violence, elder abuse, but we do not have a law right now in the United States that outlaws workplace abuse. We do have anti-discrimination employment law. So if you are a BIPOC person, if you're LGBTQ, if you're living with other disabilities, if you're pregnant, there are laws. Most of us don't know how to use them. Um, so please do reach out to me, follow me on LinkedIn. Look, they create a real monster when they mob me out of a job. And I am here to work with everyone, everyone, because nobody should go through what I went through. My grandfather, Lupe, he was a farm worker. He worked in agricultural fields and he would come home on Friday nights and he would bring all six kids together and say, go to school and work hard so you don't have to work like a burro, like a donkey, like me. And he didn't know because he hadn't been into these white collar office places, right? He didn't know the kinds of toxicities that awaited us there. But there's research that shows that our exposure to the kinds of chronic stress and abuse of workplaces is killing us. In fact, for people of Mexican ancestry, the more education, the more socioeconomic status you have. In one study out of Detroit, the shorter the lifespan and the longer the years of disability. We are literally being killed by our exposure to these toxins in the workplace. So please do reach out, you know, um, Si se puede. We, yes, we can. And yes, we will together. They didn't kill me. I'm still here and you will be too. Let's do this together. Such a powerful message. Let's do this together. You know, I couldn't have said it better myself. And, you know, um, also being a workplace trauma survivor, it's, uh, Ooh, it's, it's humbling. It, it, it's yeah. Uh, 
listen, everybody, I understand how deep the conversation has been today. Uh, I understand how powerful the conversation is, and I understand that it, it may take many of you some time to process that information. Do not feel bad if you wind up feeling like you need that time, if you need a few moments. Uh, but if you find yourself on the other side saying, hey, I do need that support. I need that friendship. I need that community. I just need to be connected to somebody that knows what I'm going through. Please never feel bad about reaching out. Uh, I could speak for Dr. Ramirez and myself when, when I say that neither one of us puts something out there if we don't intend to honor it. And so when we say you are welcome, trust me, you are welcome. All right. Well, with that, join us on October 30th. It's going to be at 11 a.m. Pacific, uh, 2 p.m. Eastern. And then we're going to be back on November 13th. So that's every other Wednesday for the next month, uh, potentially more, where we provide more of this information. It's going to be just an amazing event. I will be seeing you, but you will not be hearing me. I'm very excited about that. So will my wife. Um, so with that, I, I don't know. How do we how do we end this? I'd like to invite everyone to do a breathing exercise with me, if that's helpful. Um, this is something that can be done anywhere. So I like giving people self-defense things that they could do at work where nobody even sees. OK, so there are um, strengths and resiliencies that we have from BIPOC communities, from queer communities. So being able to do things just under the radar, both of our communities know how to do this, right? So I'm bringing some of that cultural resistance and resilience to you here. I'll, I'll teach you two things. One is I mentioned before, when you sway, even if you're in an office chair, if you're in a meeting and you just start swaying like this, that's a normal behavior in a meeting, right? It's actually helping your nervous system to regulate. It's helping to interrupt the release of those stress hormones and release those feel-good hormones that bring the thinking part of your brain back online. So that's one thing you can do. You can sit and you can rock for a little bit. You can go for a walk if you have the physical ability to do so. Um, another thing that you can do is breathing. Any time that you breathe with a longer exhalation than inhalation, that activates that vagus nerve that I was mentioning that connects the brain to all of the organs. And it helps the body again to stop releasing stress hormones and start releasing the feel good hormones like serotonin, which is one of those hormones that's released or increased uptake through an antidepressant that's part of the SSRI group. So what I'm showing you today is actually starting to activate your own brain as a pharmacy right without the side effects how cool is that okay so what we do this is called box breathing so you can imagine a box it has a top it has a side down and then a bottom and then an up on the side and i like to do this where i'm actually drawing the box on my leg underneath the table so nobody sees it okay so what we do is we take an inhalation to the count of four we hold it going down the side to the count of four and then when we exhale we just exhale to the count of six we do it longer Okay, and then we don't take a breath up for the count of four. So I'll show you, we'll do this together. So we'll take a deep breath in. One, two, three, four, hold it. One, two, three, four, slower exhale. One, two, three, four, five, six, no breath. One, two, three, four, and then take another deep breath in. One, two, three, four, hold it. One, two, three, four, and slower exhalation. One, two, three, four, five, six. So this can be done anywhere you're at. You're in a meeting, you're on the bus, wherever you might be, you can just do a few rounds of that can be really helpful. And then another freebie, if I can, another thing is cold water. If you go and you put cold water on your face, like immerse your face in a bucket with cold water, you take a cold shower, or you get some an ice pack or bag of frozen peas, 
put it on the back of your neck here where the vagus nerve is, that very quickly will do what's called the dive reflex. And it will, it's like an emergency break on a moment of overwhelming stress and anxiety. Have a great day, everyone. Have a peaceful day. Uh, and remember your mental health. We'll see you in two weeks. Thank you so much, Dan. Thank you for everyone who's been here.